All right, if I could have your attention, I would like to uh, call the May 2012 meeting of the Northeast Ohio Sustainable Communities Consortium uh, to order. Uh, thanks for coming out this afternoon. Uh, I'm Jason Segedy. I'm the, the chair of the board for 2012. I'm also the director of the Akron Metropolitan Area Transportation Study, which is the Metropolitan Planning Organization for Greater Akron. That was a, a mouthful. Uh, I'm also with the Quality Connected Places work stream. And just real quickly, if we could start to my left and go around the table, if you could introduce yourself and your affiliation and which work stream that you're working with. Uh, Tom Tyrrell, I'm a uh, Managing Director of Collaborex, and I'm a um, Vice Chair of the RPI Board and Secretary of this Board, and it's kind of crossover on the work stream's economic development directly. I'm Sarah Meyer, I'm with the DACA, and I'm Howard Mayer's alternate, and I'm on the Connections Work Stream co-chair. Rachel McCartney with Eastgate, co-chair of the Environments Work Stream. So I got you with Eastgate uh, Connection. Bill Davino, the City of Youngstown Community Development Plan. Ron Short of Shasta State University, the Economic Development Force. Bill Miller, I'm the director of the Trumbull County Planning Commission, and I'm affiliated with the Quality Connected Places and Data GIS. <coughs> I'm Howard Mayer with NOACA, uh, treasurer of the board. Months and I'm on the uh, Connections Committee. Hi, Brad Chase with the Museum of Natural History. I'm on the Connections Committee and the Communications Committee. Uh, my name is Larry Davis. I'm not Shauna. I am from Berkeley, but uh, the Cuyahoga Metropolitan Housing Authority. I'm the manager of sustainability and the last minute building. Nancy Bynes, the city of Valeria, community development. I'm on the environment's work stream. Ali Brindo, mayor of Valeria. Ed Jerry's Director of Regional Collaboration for Cuyahoga County Economic Development Work Street. I'm Brad Wade, but also on the Economic Development Work Street. Uh, Connie Krauss, I'm the Director of Community and Economic Development for Summit County on the Economic Development Work Street. Mike Lyons, I'm a uh, representative from the RPI and uh, I'm on the Communications and Engagement Work Street. Uh, Jerry Adley, I'm Director of NAPCO uh, on the Executive Committee and Environment work stream and a data GIS. Bob now with Stark County Regional Planning and Housing Community Tour Work Stream. Uh, Jeff Dutt with SCATS on the Connection Tour Stream as well as working with the GIA, GIS group. George Carter, <coughs> Captain Charity, Youngstown uh, Housing and Communities Work Stream. Pam Hodgins, Deputy Director at the Metropolitan Housing Authority and Housing Communities. Mike Challenger, Lorraine County Growth Partnership, and a member of the uh, Quality Connected Places. <coughs> Peggy Carlo, Asheville County Commissioner, and the Quality. Uh, Steve Hambly, Medina County Commissioner, uh, on the uh, Quality Connected Places and the Connections uh, Work Street, and second Vice Chair. Uh, Kelly Harris, Administrative Assistant. Hunter Morrison, Executive Director of Quality Connected Places. Okay, well, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, first order of business, as is our custom, if there is anyone here from the public that wishes to address the consortium, we do provide a couple minutes uh, for that to happen. So if there is anyone in the audience that would wish to do so now, uh, we would entertain that. I don't think I see anyone. Um, if not, moving on to the next item of business, uh, the organization and work program. Item 3A is uh, the minutes of the April meeting. I do believe there was one correction to the minutes. Uh, they incorrectly uh, showed Erin Siebel from Summit County not being here, and she, she was in <laughs> fact here. Uh, so the staff has corrected that. Uh, if there are, are not any other uh, corrections or questions or comments on the minutes, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, the, uh, the next item, uh, 3B, is the presentation of current financials and budget, and I will turn that over to, uh, to Emma Barcelona. So in your packets and in the pre-reads, you have copies of our uh, expenditures through uh, end of April 2012 based on our existing budget. 
uh, expenditures are, are right on, in fact, uh, I guess lower than expected uh, given the progress, but at the same time, we'll be making some adjustments to budget moving forward so it aligns more closely with the work that we're doing. Are there any questions on our expenditures? So the second sheet you have available is the cash position. This is the receipts from our sources as well as the disbursements. This will be the last month, April through the uh, end of April, actually is the last month too, that you'll see a smaller drop in HUD. The way we're operating moving forward, as I noted in our last meeting, is that for contracts, we will be drawing the full amount of the contract once it is approved by the board. Uh, meaning we will have the cash on hand to pay out on that contract as the contract moves forward, as opposed to drawing as each invoice is received. So uh, we'll have a higher level of receipted funds by the next month at the report. Uh, the, then the third piece is our existing contract status. So you're able to check on and see uh, uh, pending invoices and expended invoices on the contracts that we have open at this time. All of those are moving forward. Are there any questions I can answer with regard to contracts or cash position? Okay. So then the next piece is the, our audit. Our auditors did complete their on-site activity uh, most of the, by the end, by mid last week. Uh, we do plan on, and this could change, but I wanted to at least note it. We do intend to have. Uh, anybody who's interested in participating in um, prior to the next executive committee on June 12th, an hour-long session to interact with the auditors as they present the audit to you. In addition, they will either be participating in the June or July board meeting for about 10 or 15 minutes to present to you the audit and the audit findings. If, so. But the good news is at this point that they're not anticipating any challenges. There were not many expenditures last year, but all in all, they're, we're, they're very pleased not only with the information they've been provided, but also their general assessments of our operations. And NOAC, of course, has a, we have a lot to thank them for it, given the, their role as fiscal agent and keeping us in that good place. Okay. Any, uh, any questions for Emma on anything that she presented? Okay, thanks, Emma. All right, uh, moving on to item number four. Uh, we have a couple uh, reports on um, both the activities of the, the board uh, and the executive committee. Uh, Sarah Mayer has a couple updates on uh, the consortium membership and the leverage match. Uh, before we do that, I just wanted to give a quick update on the, uh, the executive committee. Um, most of you, I think, were contacted by Curary, which is the firm that we hired to do facilitation of our board meetings and kind of help facilitate um, the organizational design of the project in general. And uh, a lot of their work is now complete as far as the surveys and some of the interviews uh, that they did with all of you. And uh, one of the findings, I think, was that board members were generally somewhat all over the place as far as kind of the aspirations for, for the project um, and, and where we were heading. And I think that's pretty natural, um, not to, to go into a long-winded story, but I was involved with this back in uh, the summer of 2010, as were some of you also when we first got the idea to put uh, a grant application together to HUD. And uh, I think it occurred to those of us who were kind of in on the founding of the consortium that uh, we, we had never really done a whole lot of onboarding of new members or kind of, kind of an orientation or gotten much clarity uh, in terms of a, a mission statement or a vision. And I know sometimes visions or mission, mission statements tend to be a little stilted and cliched, but um, I think nevertheless it was probably something that should have been done uh, that wasn't. So in working with Curary on the executive committee and with that team that had kind of put the grant application together, we realized that a lot of the way that this organization has evolved is that we kind of got everyone together before maybe we were as clear as we could have been or should have been on kind of what our purpose was and where we were going, other than yes, we're delivering 
um, delivering a, a um, plan back to HUD. But other than that, we, I think, could have used a little more clarity. So what we've been doing with Curie over the last couple weeks is um, coming up with doing what we called foundational work as far as getting a little bit more clear on, on the mission of the organization. And um, the culmination of a lot of that was also then that influences very heavily the design. And if you think about our design, we have quite a few different moving parts. We've got this board, we've got an executive committee, we have, depending on how you count them, either five or seven work streams. We've got a program ma management office. And what we're starting to do at the exec executive committee level with Curary is looking at how all these moving pieces and parts fit together. And we're starting to look at both, I guess what I would call soft infrastructure and more, I guess you would say, the hard infrastructure of, of how we're designed. And that's kind of a work in progress right now. Um, we will be having a special session of the executive committee tomorrow at the uh, AMATS office, which is, which is where I work. Uh, anyone in the executive committee, um, we did discuss it at the last meeting, but if you weren't there, you're more than welcome to attend. It's from 10 to 3, uh, 3 o'clock, and I think our intention is to flesh out um, a little bit more on the organizational design and then identify any changes we might want to recommend um, back to the board. So I guess with that, if there are any comments for those of you that have been involved with it or any uh, questions as to what, what I described, um, please I would entertain those now. You know, Jason, the only thing I might add is um, it seems to be coming through as a pretty resounding message from the work with Carreri and these discussions uh, that we want to bring greater project management uh, discipline uh, and executional capabilities into the program. And I think that that has been fairly universally uh, embraced. And I guess my only uh, worry in all of this is it feels like it's un unfolding naturally for a lot of the areas, uh, but I think we're going to be in a bit of a pickle just in terms of the timing of making a lot of this happen, because there are some things that I think are bubbling out of this that is going to involve uh, involve this board. And I'm just wondering if we might take steps as a board uh, to make sure that we can uh, keep this moving along in a timely uh, fashion. You know, we've had some conversations about this. We've talked to Hunter and so forth. So rather than going through the steps of, of, of uh, at, at least at the at the top of this project management capability of coming back and then you know getting board input and then another board meeting to do a review of possible individuals or consultants to work with us and so forth. I worry that it will be the fall before we've had a chance to onboard uh, any capability. So I'd like to suggest um, that we empower you and a committee of the board members, whoever you think see fit. Uh, to be able to uh, go out and shape that position and fill that position um, in in the near term. Uh, I'd love to get reactions to that, and if, if it's reasonable, I think we could go ahead and I'm, I'm hoping we could uh, decide to do that today, not with respect to the whole infrastructure, but just you know, kind of at the senior level here uh, in, in the NOSCC where we know we need either an individual or, or some sort of consulting capacity uh, to make sure that we're uh, hitting our deadlines and moving along. Reactions to, uh, to what Brad proposed? I, I guess I'll give one as, as chair. I, I think that that's a very appropriate step as, um, as we've worked with Curary and I think just being involved with the project. I think a lot of the um, managing the different moving parts of it and all the between fulfilling some of the administrative uh, requirements of HUD and facilitating work streams and all these other moving parts, I do think that, that that's come across as a fairly significant need and I think we've seen deadlines you know, for projects and, and products slipping uh, already and, and just for those of you that might not be aware, I mean we are getting close to the 18 month mark, which is about the halfway point uh, for the grant. So I, I do agree with Brad and I, I think it would behoove us to at least investigate the possibility of bringing on some 
um, some additional capacity or at least figuring out a regimen that we could apply to, uh, to make the management of, uh, of the project a little bit more seamless. You know, I'll add to that that um, <clears throat> we put a lot of time into this process and and had and had the ability to make up a lot of time now. And I think your proposal is a good one because it gives us the flexibility to be able to make some judgments on the things that over the next two or three meetings we're going to have finalized, and to be able to take that in place and be able to pass that information on um, in the normal process is it, it is going to put us behind the eight ball. Eighteen months with the right process, we can be very effective in doing what we need to do, knowing that it's going to be driven from a board standpoint and there's responsibility. But if every piece we lose off of that is, is something that we're going to have to work that much harder. So I just think sitting in every meeting that we've had of this thing, we've made such good progress to get to this point, and now we're kind of to the finite details, and I think your proposal is a real good idea. Would you anticipate hiring a permanent um, person, or would you do this through a contractual obligation through a consultant? Do you have, have you discussed that? I don't. I don't think at this point we would uh, we would know yet, Connie. This, this week, Connie is uh, this week and next week is we're going through. If you recall it, well, at the executive committee meeting, we kind of demonstrated through X uh, page, and there's been work done on management mechanisms. But we need to be able to bring the people who are going to execute into that process to make sure that they've got input. And I think with that piece, which is what's going to happen over the next two sessions, we'll be able to know where we stand on that, what the qualities are, what with the way so the other. Be able to bring that back to the board then once it's been vetted by the executive committee, instead of us just giving our okay at this meeting today. We're meeting every month as a board. I don't anticipate that you'll do anything as quickly as four weeks. I, I would think that we would we would be on a timeline where we wouldn't really have much to report until the next board meeting. So I think that's something that could could and should come back to the the board we might we might take it however um, because expediency is is important and and I think what Brad was getting at was having something where we would be ready to go when we come back to the board the next time that we would have identified the process we would have to be able to look at the staff and the way it's going to function within the pieces so it might be a pretty advanced um, presentation it may not be something where we're just asking for a lot of input on the process I, Brad, is I that understand that we could make a decision then as opposed to just giving our, our, yeah. our approval right now what to make a decision based on something we yeah. have no idea yeah. what we're talking about. One way we might do this, in a sense, because it looks kind of appeal, is um, if you want, I can turn it into a motion. Um, could, could I ask yeah. a question before we have a motion? <laughs> I, I guess my, my question is, are we talking about hiring an operations manager for the project? Someone to coordinate the consultants? That, I, I'm not clear on what we're really talking that, about. That, I think that could be an option. I don't think we've gotten far enough to know yet. Well, I think the, 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 the pressing need we have is for the day-to-day -day project management leadership of executing against the work plan. So we've got these five to seven work committees ensuring that they're chartered, that they're executing against work plans delivering and hitting milestones and things of that sort. So that's an operations role in your mind. I call it project management role, but I, but that's what it really is. Howard. I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand. Now, you already have a staff in place. This is what uh, I would imagine is the place to do exactly what you're saying. Come on somebody in addition to, uh, to the folks that are already on the payroll. That is correct. Well, we had always envisioned, as you recall, in the original proposal, we had always envisioned that there would be a project management capability uh, in this initiative. And uh, that, that has then evolved in a different way through time, such that we've had now a Carreri playing one role, we've had some of the staff playing other roles, and so that initially envisioned role of the, the, the project management leader um, is something that hasn't been fulfilled through the course of our work. And this is really addressing something, as Jason indicated, that came up in, in the earliest days of these discussions. And I think as a starting point, the meeting that I mentioned that we're having tomorrow with the executive committee and the staff, um, the entire staff is going to be invited to be there in the morning session 
and I think we would like to have a discussion there amongst the, the whole staff and the executive committee about um, about the needs with, is with regards to project management as far as for things that have have slipped or work products that have been identified that we haven't gotten as much progress as we would like kind of starting to delve into figuring out um, how we can make that work more smoothly and then I think at that point that may point us toward what type of capacity do we need to manage I mean which I think could in my mind could run the gamut from just tweaking things with the staff that are already in place and not bringing anybody on up until you know up to maybe getting some sort of a consultant or person to kind of be a you know an operations officer I just don't think we know yet at this point was this discussed with, with the staff already? Was this, this, uh, uh, We've had discussions with Hunter, yes. So, Jason, these are ongoing discussions. Yes, so that's correct. Nothing has really been decided. No. But at that point, in this meeting, I mean, tomorrow is once you gather some information to get more input from the staff, then you could make a decision on whether it's a person or a actual hire or a contract right what I'd like to see happen is probably you know we will have our meeting tomorrow we may need to do a couple follow-up meetings and then my hope would be by the upcoming executive committee in June we might have enough detail where we could put a recommendation to the executive committee um, for, for moving forward on on adding capacity in whatever fashion we need to add the capacity to manage the project. And, and it's probably important to add that we've had about 40 hours of meetings on this topic since the first week in April. So there's been constant planning, but the level that we're at has to have input from the staff to be able to take it to the next level. Otherwise, you're making decisions for them. So. Jason, um, when we had talked about this at the executive committee, um, we have this small group and we're opening up all the meetings to the members of the executive correct do we anticipate that continuing yes if we appoint this, this, what, this ad hoc committee or well I think that yeah the this all, all of the decisions and talking about the managerial capacity for the project would be executive committee level decisions I think I don't want to put words in Brad's mouth but I think Brad was suggesting that maybe we that maybe I identify a smaller group of people to flesh out some of the details but all of that would be brought back to the executive committee and I think for anyone that has angst about hiring someone I mean any decision to hire anyone over twenty five thousand dollars has to come back to the board so there's certainly a a process in place for the for the entire board to weigh in on um, any well, I, I decision like that. If thing. you have angst as well, you would approach Jason with a possibly sitting on this. Yes. I think for the sake of expediency, I would say that since there's been 40 hours, so to speak, already, I would say that that I would agree with that to go ahead and allow me to do Any uh, any further discussion? I think well, you were getting ready to make a motion. So what I would like to do is uh, move that we empower the chair uh, to appoint and lead an ad hoc committee of the board uh, to do four tasks to define a project management leadership role, to clarify its relationship to the program office and the board. Third is to recruit candidates, and fourth is to make a recommendation to the board on a preferred path ahead. I would second that. Okay, we have a motion on the floor and a second. Any further discussion? Holly. Just the one step that perhaps wasn't reiterated in that was taking a look at existing staff to see if there might be some responsibilities reallocated to address that within the existing staff we have instead of adding another person. <coughs> Brad, we'll need a copy of the text of that. Okay. Oh, a work in progress. Any uh, any further comments on the motion? Okay. Oh, go ahead, Connie. Just for one comment, for those of us who are in government, 
if we were to do this, it would be called wasteful government spending. Um, you know what I mean? I mean, adding more staff, we don't have the capacity to add staff anymore. I mean, we have been told that we need to do what we do with what we have. And I would hope that we would spend a lot of time looking at creating capacity for staff. We have all offered in our match the ability to provide staffing if staff needs help. So um, I think we need to remember that when we're looking at what it is we're doing. That's an important point. Uh, I think we do have to look at better utilizing the capacity uh, that's there. My only pushback would be if we do just come to the conclusion we just don't have the capacity uh, to manage the project with the delivery date to HUD in mind, then what we'll actually end up doing is defaulting on delivering what we promised and we'll end up wasting considerably more money and time and effort. So that's just the other bookend, I think, of the... For those of us who have dealt with HUD. Right. We, I think we've been pushing about this for, since the inception of NEOSCC. I think that's been a major concern, at least it has been for me, in any of the discussions that I've had, is pushing to meet HUD deadlines because whether you think HUD's going to be flexible or not, <laughs> they got a drop dead date and we've dealt with that, so... Good point. Just one more thing, so I understand, Jason. Um, we are um, not delegating any decision-making authority to this ad hoc committee, only to make a recommendation. To be right. I think the intention is just to have a small, manageable, nimble group that we can meet fairly Absolutely. quickly, and then any recommendations of that group would go to the executive committee and then the board. <coughs> okay. Uh, Reaction to the motion, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Okay, now I think, Sarah, you are, you are on for the next two reports. Yes, um, in the mail out that you received last week, there was a leverage match form dated May 15th that was updated with packets that you might have picked up today with the 21st on the on the sheet. Uh, we ended up receiving a few more leveraged match um, tracking forms in the interim. So our our total received to date is $783,000. You'll see though that there's still a few entities that still have not um, submitted any information on their leverage match. This is important because HUD does need verification that we are you know, meeting our commitments in terms of the leverage match that we put through in our application, as well as the auditors now are asking to make sure that we have this information readily available. So if you have not um, submitted anything to date, please do get those in within a week. Um, we've gotten a pretty good catch up. You'll see that there's a lot to have submitted through the first quarter of 2012, but there's still quite a few that are outstanding. If you have any questions, you can ask me directly about them, um, and just get your forms in if you would. And we still have the 32 members for our consortium. That has not changed. Any questions for Sarah on that item? Okay, um, Sarah, was there any update on the membership agreements themselves? I'm still at Okay, just that, that, was, that was the report on that. Okay, thanks. Uh, next item is the 2012 Board and Executive Committee meeting schedule. Uh, you, you guys might recall, and I'm going to turn, turn it over to Jeff Vanderley in a second here, but we did uh, agree upon doing a 12, 12 meetings in 12 months. Um, set of board meetings. So the first deviation from our meeting here in Hudson uh, is going to be our next board meeting, June 26, which we will be holding uh, in Youngstown. And I think Jeff was going to give you a little bit more information on the uh, the events for that and the, the logistics, perhaps. Um, yes, yeah, so the June 26 meeting will take place at the Cavalli Center in downtown Youngstown. Uh, we have uh, right now we have that is. The one event that we have scheduled, but we're going to be doing some other engagement events in the morning and in the evening because as we talked about, we wanted to make this kind of a day of NEOSCC within the, the counties themselves. 
So uh, we will be sending out additional information uh, on that soon. The one thing that will be a little bit different when we start traveling around is that we would really love to be able to lock into RSVPs earlier rather than uh, Monday or Tuesday before. So um, we will be sending a notice out probably the first week of June about this meeting um, with more details about how you can be involved in other events um, throughout the day in Youngstown. But uh, I think that uh, as, a, as a starting place, uh, Youngstown contingent over here has, uh, I think, provided us a safe, uh, a safe landing for this first one. So we're looking forward to being on the road. What kind of timeline should we lock up just to make sure we cover? Well, I, you know, optimistically, I would like to get, I mean, the board meeting will be established from one to three. I would like to see things from late morning into the evening. So, um, but again, it's dependent on how some of our other partners out there, what we can, uh, what we can uh, put together. You know, we have different members from Mahoney County on the board. Um, so we'll be looking to them. We'll also be inviting local officials to come out and local residents to come out to uh, partake in the different events throughout the day. And uh, being that that is also the day that we'll be launching the uh, Conditions and Trends platform, it will be kind of a nice thing uh, to have in, in Mahoney County that day. So. Yeah, we've got the Cabelli Center uh, set aside for 12 to 4. Uh, there's no other activities that day at the center. If you've never been to the Cabelli Center, it's a 7,000 seat arena. Uh, you know, take uh, the queue up in Cleveland and shrink it down a little bit. You got the Cabelli, that's a great place. We can arrange for a tour after the board meeting of the Cabelli Center. We can, we can set that up and uh, maybe a reception at our office prior to the board meeting. So there's a lot of things we'll do. We'll, we'll get it set up, but it's, it's, it's a nice place to come and uh, visit. It's the community room, it's about the size of this room. And we'll do a little tour of the Cabelli after. So if we could fill up the summer houses. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a crowd. You know, I'll have to do a lot of marketing. John, one of the things we had talked about when we were looking at making these was to get things that you guys consider your real benchmarks, the things that are unique to what you're doing there that we could come in and present. So as we're looking at what a, a successful community, sustainable community, we can look at the best of each of the regions as we make our visits. Can we do something like that that you can bring in and maybe YBI for example? I mean, they're, the stuff that they're doing is good or, or, or other things that might make a lot of sense that people aren't aware of that are really good about what's going on there? Yeah, YBI, B&M. I mean, there's quite a bit of things. And we have our, um, our Youngstown event for young leaders where we have about 80 young leaders come out the energy out there about what we're doing is, is really great, so I think this will be this will be a good first launch. Bill's yeah. already making a list here. So yeah. we'll just it. Okay. And Jeff, logistically speaking, as of right now, we're still on for one o'clock that day, right? Yeah, I yeah. In, unless we do it differently, I think that we should still have the board meetings from one to three, so that people um, have that in their schedule, and then we do the other meetings around that additive to the day. So unless we. Unless after a meeting or two through these 12 counties, we realize that we need to move into another part of the day. I think that mm -hmm. number three is good. Okay, and I just suggest uh, you guys probably already had this covered, but getting a map up on yeah, the, we'll the website yeah, yeah, we'll so that. everyone can find it. And, very, and, and, very easy to find, very ample parking, of course. It's a convention center. Huh. We could also put some ride shares too, because I think it would be great to, to look at this in terms of the EMT as well. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, yes, I, I was I was going to question Jeff thought of this already, but I, I wondered if there was interest in some kind of a ride uh, van bus. I mean, years ago, Amats did a hill train uh, to, and maybe one from the from the Cleveland area. Also, I just wondered if, if we knew maybe we could coordinate our schedules a little bit. And, well, you know, if, if we can get the agenda together in the next week or two and then set on the notice of who would want to take the van, um, then I think we could, we could definitely look at that. That's a great opportunity to get a bunch of us together and able to talk for that hour's time each way mm -hmm. to really kind of share ideas and get to know people better. That would be great. Yeah. Other questions? So this is, uh, potentially, we'll probably circle back to Hudson. At some point, but the next time you see Mayor Curran, please thank them because they've been a wonderful host 
over the last year for us here, and uh, it always leaves us food and, and, and water and things like that. So next time you see Mayor Kern, just thank him for his hospitality over the last year. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, I guess just one other meeting announcement, the, uh, the executive committee meeting we, we were discussing just in the, the previous item on the, looking at the management capacity. Like I said, I anticipate that that'll probably be the meeting that we have uh, a report out maybe on a recommendation and that will be June 12th at 1.30 um, at the uh, NEOSCC offices in downtown Akron. And with that, I will move on to item five, uh, the program office report. And I think the primary item there is the communications and engagement update. And I will turn it back over to Jeff. Right. Well, for some reason, it's not reading the PowerPoint, but you all have this in front of you right now. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> really, today we wanted to take a couple minutes. It's been a couple months since uh, I presented um, the overall communications and engagement framework. I think that was back either at the December or January board meeting. Um, and within that framework, we really focused on um, <clears throat> setting out kind of the philosophies and principles for engagement going forward. And so today what we want to do is kind of circle back to that and give you an update on what we've accomplished since then as well as kind of the look forward. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the overall communications and engagement goals and kind of our approach. And then Jeff Rusnick from our strategy is gonna talk a little about communication strategy going forward and also talk about the public opinion polling that we just completed. Um, <clears throat> our communications and engagement work stream started meeting back in, I think, September of 2011 to really focus on how we could deliver a, a very different engagement experience for the region um, and not only create a different experience but also create an enduring platform to go forward after our, our, our initiative is completed. So you see here on the communication engagement goals um, that we had a lot of goals that were kind of focused on, on board activities and, and board interactions which I think Carreri is really doing a, a wonderful job in addressing some of those and, and the facilitation around that. Um, another goal was to really create an understanding of regional and local issues and opportunities. And while doing that, really kind of create a dialogue that will result in collaborative action to move forward. And so what we're going to try to do over the next year and a half is really educate um, the community about sustainability and about some of our issues and findings, but also really engage them and, and, and have them become stakeholders so that they can see themselves in their final vision moving forward. Um, HUD in, in particular is very interested in how we're going to reach underserved and underrepresented and those that have historically not participated in the past. So um, next month we're going to be unfolding and, and, and displaying our engagement plan and I think that you'll find that we hit a lot of these communications and engagement goals uh, by the tools and methods that we describe next month. Um, our approach really has been focused on the integration of a couple of our consultants along with our work stream. Uh, we have the communications consultant, which is uh, our strategy, uh, public engagement consultant, which is the Cobalt Group, uh, Patty Choby, who uh, was retained back in April, and then the board engagement work that Sally and her team are doing. So really it's kind of the infusion of all those things and so that we're able to reflect not only what's going on at the board level, but also what's going on in the work streams, what's going out in the general public of engagement so that this is a, a really integrated effort moving forward. Um, one of the uh, themes that we talked about within the communications framework back in January was really the cycle of learning, sharing, creating, and acting. And this is something that I think is, is relevant no matter what stage or place you are within the consortium or within the region, that we really want to create a, an engagement platform that really helps people to learn from each other, to share each other's lessons, uh, to create plans and create a future, and then to act on that in the, in the future. So I think that you'll see a lot of that in what Jeff's going to present today and in, in the next agenda item about the uh, conditions and trends platform. Um, before turning it over to Jeff, I did want to say that uh, on the engagement side of things, um, we really have an interesting opportunity this Thursday. We're hosting a 
uh, all-day workshop on engagement. Um, one of the ideas that came up as we were interviewing consultants was that we had such a wealth of knowledge and expertise that came to the interview process and submitted proposals. So on Thursday, we've actually retained three of the other consultants that weren't selected to come in for a one-day workshop and agree to kind of share their ideas along with our work stream to um, formalize the tactical plan. So uh, beyond Patty and Cobalt, Jeff and his team will be there from our strategy. We'll also have people from the Civic Commons there and from Fleshman Hillard, as well as from the Tree Network, which is the University of Akron and the Innovation Alliance. So I think this is a really great opportunity to have people come together and collaborate in such a way. And I was really uh, excited that all the other firms that didn't get the job still decided to come and join us on Thursday. And lastly, on engagement, I had up at the beginning the slideshow from the Young Leader events. Uh, this again was something that we brought before this board, I think in late January or February, to launch our engagement efforts through the Young Leaders within the 12 counties. Um, and I can say after finishing the five different events, we've reached probably over 300 or 350 um, Young Leaders throughout the region through a real dynamic session that uh, not only gathered a lot of great input and feedback that will start to feed into the loop of engagement, but also caused uh, a bit of media attention for us and created kind of a buzz about what it is we're doing. And I think these young leader groups um, are going to be kind of the focus area or, or the trial area for a real iterative process going forward because we're going to meet with these same groups every quarter throughout the rest of the project. So this first one, we talked about more general issues about what it means to be vibrant in the region. The next one, we're going to talk about the findings and, and the conditions and trends platform, but continue to build that base so that at the end of this, particularly young leaders will be uh, understanding what an MPO does. They'll understand what some of our different board member organizations do and, um, and, and understand it in a way that makes sense to them. And I think kind of hit them and, on issues that really are important to them going forward. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Rusnick from our strategy to talk about our overall communication strategy. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate that. Um, today we're going to focus on the communications aspect of the communications and engagement um, process. We have been working for the last uh, couple of months on a very comprehensive communications program, as many of you are aware. Um, we're in, where we're starting right now is on the, in the discovery phase. Um, and as part of the development of your overall communication strategy, we are working on the conditions and trends platform, which you're going to hear extensively about in a little bit. Your, uh, it works there. Okay. The remote there. I'll get you there. That'll go forward. Okay. So um, we're in the discovery phase, as I just mentioned. It, Part of that discovery phase is the conditions and trends platform, which is really um, to give you some baseline information about where things stand within the 12 county region. Uh, it, it's a statement of findings. Um, there are some themes and narratives that are emerging from those findings, which you'll hear about as well. Um, but we've also just wrapped up a public opinion survey. Survey came out of the field uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and I'll get into detail about that in a little bit. And we're working on developing some initial messaging. And we've, you've seen some of those elements. Those of you who are on the communications um, group at our meeting a couple of weeks ago, we handed out a folder that started to show you some of the talking points and message points, ways that we're addressing some of the issues, and how we're helping prepare those who are communicating with the general public. You've seen a lot of that product in, in public right now through the media. The, um, both in the Steve Litt piece that appeared in the, in the Plain Dealer and the follow-up editorial, the Steve Hoffman piece that was in the Akron Beacon Journal, the WCPN piece, that um, the hour-long program at, at 9 a.m. a couple of weeks ago, and those types of, um, those, that type of coverage is already starting to emerge. And if you don't think that the message is starting to penetrate, if you heard CPN this morning, even the program that they did on biking this morning, you had people starting to echo our message and using the term creating a vibrant region and creating a vibrant Northeast Ohio in the context of biking. And that was a key ingredient to it. So that's starting to, that is starting to get out there. Um, 
the plan itself will help define our audiences. What does that mean? Who are our audiences? We have several audiences that we need to approach in different ways. One is the media. Two are planners and government, governmental bodies and, and governmental officials. Three are the institutions and organizations, many of whom are on this board. Um, and, and fourth is the public. And the key with the public is really to take those constituents and move them from constituents to stakeholders. There's a conversion process that we want to see take place along the, along the way here. We'll do that through a number of channels, through social media, through earned media, um, the development of collateral materials and advertising. And importantly, we will establish and begin to build media partnerships so that we get maxim maximization of return of your investment in this process. Um, how does this fit into the overall scheme here? Right now, we're at the beginning point. We're in the initial stage, that what I call the discovery phase. That's done through the conditions and trends platform. It establishes where we are now, and it starts to define the challenges that we are facing and the assets that are at our disposal. What do we have? What are those assets that we have? Um, and this is all in your material, so if, um, so if you don't have it, I mean, if you don't have to really write this stuff down. Um, the second part of it is really, it's what Jeff just called the, the sharing and the creating part, the process. The engagement of an assessment of it and determining how to address those challenges and how NIAS will help. And finally, the third kind of the, the third act here is, go, is the portion where we are going forward. How do we move forward here? And how do we create a framework for action and give the tools to the region um, to move forward here? You are, you're the ones that are building this, and we're the ones that are helping you figure out how to best present it to the various audiences that we define. How do we build the message? Where does the message come from? What's the process that we go through? Number one, it's research-based. Conditions and Trends platform is providing us a huge amount of data, a wealth of information. But we're also using public opinion research. As I said, there's a, the survey, which I'll get to in a second. Um, we will do, from that, we're going to devise a message that maximizes the impact. It'll help define sustainability, but also lead, um, lead to linking sustainability to the values that people have and share, and to, and to show the impact that sustainability has on everyone's lives. Um, it, we're going to organize it around the work streams, obviously, um, and we're going we're to build an overarching message for the whole project, but it will be customized and, specific and tailored to specific audiences. So there'll be a, an, you know, the umbrella here, an overarching message that gets mm -hmm. customized down depending on who the audience is, because not all messages apply to all people. Um, we can pause here for questions, or I can get into the survey if you want. If there are questions specifically about the communications and engagement program, why don't we can, we'll take those now. Just curious, in your research or what, do we know that in order to achieve what we need to achieve, that we have to identify ourselves with the word sustainability, which um, could be <laughs> controversial? Um, I, I don't know that we can conclude that right now, but there we do get, I'll get to that. There's a couple of questions specifically about sustainability in the survey. Okay. And the findings are um, probably not that surprising. So if I, I can get into some of the specifics oh, on that, you'll see, yeah. And, and if I don't address it by the survey question, then let's go back to that. Any other questions about the plan and the program? <coughs> Okay. Um, as I mentioned, there was a survey that was conducted the end of April uh, by Triad Research. And for background, um, Triad Research is based in Westlake, Ohio. They have been doing survey research for 30 plus years. Bob Dykes, uh, who heads the firm, and Kathy Severensky, his partner, have been doing public opinion research um, for quite some time. They probably have done 
more survey research and public opinion research and focus group research in Northeast Ohio than any other firm. Um, we have partnered with them on in excess of 100 surveys and research um, programs. Uh, so they obviously are extremely experienced, know this region inside and out, um, and um, have a lot of insight and knowledge into how things work here. The survey, because of trends and changes in how you communicate and reach people, kind of obvious, but um, we now switch to doing a 400 um, telephone, 400 interviews by telephone, and 400 online. So it's an 800 sample size um, with a margin of error of plus or minus 3.5%. Uh, uh, again, the, the, if you looked at some of the demographic information, you would see, uh, kind of obvious again, uh, younger pe more younger people are online, more older people are on. We got by phone. So, yes. So the telephones are random digit dial. How do you randomize the online? The, the sample for the online, they have a, um, they're able to pull a random sample of people that uh, they can pull by email addresses uh, a random sample by, uh, by, by location. So by their IP address, you can pinpoint where people are from. And they ask, there's a series of demographic questions that get asked at the, uh, at the end of the survey. I don't have those in here, but it, we can share those with you later. Um, there are a series of demographic questions that get asked at the end to make sure that the sample is random. So what, one of the things that you'll see from this is the sample's slightly more uh, female than male, than the overall population, one or two percent off. They do weight the survey so to make those adjustments. Yes. Jeff, were the telephones all landlines? Yes. Good point. Sorry for not clarifying that. Okay. So um, one of the normal things that gets asked in a survey is level of satisfaction. You know, how satisfied are you with things? Um, I would tell you that right now in Northeast Ohio, remember this is across the 12 county region, 42% are very satisfied, 46% somewhat satisfied, 88% level of satisfaction. Pretty darn good, okay? Now, when you break it down and look at, and we just started to look at the cross tabs, which are the breakdowns by uh, different regions or different def demographic information, there are, some, there are some swings here. I mean, you see, for example, the, sum, the way the regional breakdown was, for, we did Summit Stark, um, Summit Stark and Wayne is one region. Numbers are definitely lower in that region. Mahoning Valley, numbers were better than I would have expected. You would have, you know, just that's just kind of the the you know some of the surprises that you see in this um, that are here. But 88 percent being very satisfied or somewhat satisfied um, with the region as a place to live. Next question. Residents are slightly more likely to say things are getting better in Northeast Ohio than to say they're getting worse. So where, where are things trending? Um, uh, 39 to 30% get, getting better versus getting worse. So a net of plus nine here, getting better. Okay, residents are a little more optimistic about how, they, how their areas, um, the area where they live is changing. 40% um, getting better, 27% getting worse. So a net of 13% here. People feel a little better about their area than they do about the region as a whole. You skipped over something before, which I thought was a pretty big headline, even before that, at the bottom, uh, which is that uh, the lower the education level and the rural areas feel that things are getting worse. Yeah. Which stands to reason. But right. Yes. And just in terms of just so I know this is a question that several people have raised before about who were these folks, 60% came from suburban areas, 22% um, from urban areas, and 17% from rural areas, just so we understand the numbers there. Jeff? Yes. Going back to slide, how do you know? There's also another, it's like a footnote, but I think it's a pretty big one too. Uh, it says only 22%. 18 to 24 are uh, very satisfied. Yes. Uh, to me, that's a real 
And it's the same thing in the, it, it's also in the, uh, in the next group, the 25 to 35 year old, it's not as bad, but it's also lower. Do you have uh, any uh, explanation you want to show later? As to why that is, no. No, we can't, and we, you know, we don't get at the why people, you know, think that way. We could speculate on that. But, um, but we definitely see people who have been here for a longer time feel better about things. There's a couple of other questions that are asked um, about if, if you would stay in this region or plan to stay in this region. Um, and again, the same trend continue, it, it holds up in that. Younger people think more about moving. The older you are, the more likely you are to stay here. So you see that, you see that continue throughout the, 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 the huge challenge. Yes. Work. Yep. Yeah. Brain drain and brain gain. Adele. So do you know, I'm just curious about that age cohort in general. Are there any patterns nationwide about satisfaction with the way they live? I mean, it's kind of like, I'm asking, like, is it wonderlust? It's so pretty, that's, that's, that's being that, age. that is, a, it's a good point, Adele. It is more consistent, you know, with those folks are, le, you know, are more antsy and, and are, more mobile and are you know kind of wanting a uh, wanting change and wanting things different. Right. So, like, if there was a survey of eighteen to twenty-four year olds in Austin, Texas, or Portland, or Seattle, or right. any of the hot, we can. And I think it's a good thing for us to take a look at your, um, and that we can actually have for you next week when we do the full briefing on the survey. You'll see on the we're gonna um, next Wednesday the board we'll be able to get a full detailed briefing on the survey and we can try and have that question answered and take a look at it overall to see if there's a if that's a national trend or if that's something that's unique to this region. Good question. Yes. One idea would be to take information like this and go back out and talk to the young professionals who we did in the day to fall in that cohort and ask them why that is. Uh, share with them the survey and really literally ask those 18 to 24 year olds in this um, with this effort, you know, to yep. kind of answer that question for them. I think it can be, you know, I don't want to jump onto the engagement side of things, but I do think that is the kind of thing that we can probe deeper on. Okay. Um, we asked folks, uh, we gave them seven different areas and asked seven different kind of aspects of, um, of their area and asked how they felt about them, how satisfied they were. Um, and the interesting thing was that all of them tested it very well. People are very satisfied with the, these kind of quality of life characteristics and factors. Um, at the top, you know, 92% being very satisfied uh, or somewhat satisfied um, with being close to parks, trails, other outdoor activities. Safety, 87%. Um, availability of good and afford good affordable housing, 84%. Efforts to protect the environment. You see kind of a drop off there, but you're still at 73%. The fact that all seven of these um, test at 60% or greater um, is is a pretty good sign. I mean, you know, these are things that you you wouldn't necessarily think are the case. Um, quality of public schools. People feel pretty, you know, amazingly feel 69 percent. We hear, you know, that things are. If you ask people about their school system, they usually typically say, "My school system is great. Things are good here." If you ask them about some, the the rest of the schools, they say they, you know, they're not so good. So. Um, so this is a, actually pretty, um, pretty significant um, and pretty positive. Um, half of all residents would strongly recommend their area as a place to live. So 50%. Again, Howard, to your, your point earlier in your question earlier, when we looked at that by age, see the last point, those most likely to not recommend their area as a place to live are the 18 to 24 year olds. And also, sorry folks from the Valley, uh, in terms of the regional breakdown, that was the, the lowest, um, those were the lowest ones in that. Um, 
and those who feel the best about the, their, you know, their areas of place to live are Lake Geauga and Portage, 67%. Um, we asked folks, uh, what are the greatest assets you know, in their area, things that they are most proud of? And we got a wide range of, of answers here, um, a, a really wide range. But the, you know, the first couple are, are pretty important here, schools and, the quality, uh, and quality education. Uh, second would be access to museums, theaters, cultural events. Third, metro parks, city parks, recreation centers. Um, but also you see some of the other things that, that folks said. This is pretty consistent with other research that we've seen. The, there is um, there's a lot of pride in this region. Um, and I know we've in a couple of our meetings we've talked about how to tap into that pride. This is one of the, one of the ways that you start to see it and start to get at it. Um, in the work that we did on the arts and cultural issue in 2006, you saw, you know, especially um, the access to museums, theaters, and cultural events really jumped out in that about in, in terms of civic pride and the way people refer to their region. I, even I saw one of the stickers on the photos um, that were previewing when we were uh, getting started, and it said something about them being gems. And that's, that was a term that we heard over and over again uh, previously. Um, Residents are evenly divided on whether their area offers the advantages and opportunities that will keep young people here. 44% say yes, 42% say no. It's only a net of plus two. Not, I mean, that's, you know, I think that's something that we, could, we should be striving to improve, you know, to change that dynamic here. Again, consistency, residents of Lake Geauga, Portage County are more likely to say yes, 64%. Um, Mahoning Valley more likely to say no in that in that area at seventy uh, percent. Um, so again, I think that's an action point. You know, something for us to work on. Jeff, um, now let's get in a Jeff, little bit. I, just one question on the previous slide. Sure, that's a pretty big swing. Yep. You know that sixty four percent in one triad of counties would say yes, and seventy percent would say no. Were the other six counties? pretty much tracking with that, you know, with what the graph shows? Well, they, they balance out. They get to a, you get to a minus uh, two, I'm sorry, a plus two combined. So it does vary from region to region. I, as I recall, I don't know definitively, but L the Lorraine region was a little lower. Um, Lorraine, we've had Lorraine and Medina together, and Summit, Stark, Portage, Cuyahoga was a little higher. Um, but we'll get, I can... Oh, Cuyahoga was its own area. It yeah. wasn't grouped with yes. Lorraine and Medina. Okay. Right. Yeah. In terms of geography, 30, it, and it matches basically the population of the region, 37% were out of Cuyahoga, 12% um, out of Lorraine, Medina, 11% from Lake Geauga Portage, uh, 26 from Summit, Stark, and Wayne, and 14% uh, from Mahoning, Trumbull, and Ashtabula. Yep. Um, only a small percentage could give a reasonable description as they defined it, as Triad defined it um, or described it of sustainability. Only 9% could say you know, something along the lines of it's an open-ended, uh, continuing to live or grow without depleting resources. Um, there are a few other things here that jumped out that people did mention, ability to maintain your current quality of life, ability to continue flourishing or thriving, longevity, long lasting or stability. Um, kind of broad but not very specific as, as you see. Um, but three-fifths, even though they don't really know what it, what it is, three-fifths of respondents say it's extremely important to make sure that Northeast Ohio is a sustainable place for future generations. So not only three-fifths say it's extremely important, but another 33% say it's very important, 92%. They, you know, the general concept, when you give it to them, they like it. You're not gonna improve that. And my guess is it will pro that will probably decline or dip um, over the next six to 12 months. 
Why? Why do I think that's the case? You've got a presidential election, going to be a lot of attention on, you know, could be a lot of attention on issues like this. Two, you have, um, the more we're out there and the more visible we are, the more attention we attract. So people may start to think about this. And so, you know, you start off at this high watermark at 92%, you may come down a little bit. My hope is that by the end, you know, a year and a half from now, we start to go back up again and that we get back up to that 92% mark. But that's a pretty, you know, that's a fairly high place um, to be, 92%. We obviously have a lot of educating to do in order to, you know, to inform folks about that, about these, these issues, and that's, you know, that's what we're here to discuss. Um, Three-fourths of the residents say their area's economic future depends a lot on the rest of Northeast Ohio. Um, so, you know, 75% say, say that, um, getting into regionalism, um, which we, we asked a few questions about. Three-fifths or more of every demographic group say the economic future of their area depends on the rest of Northeast. So I, just, I have a question on the sustainability piece. There may be the time to come back to my question. I just want to see if I understand the logic train. Yep. Which is people don't understand what sustainability is but believe it's important. Therefore, that's something we can and should tap into? Yes. Okay. Now, my question to you, though, is that if people are given that same question, do they have to believe that it is without choice? Right? Because I'm for sustainability as long as I don't, it doesn't impinge upon me in any way. And does that level of support fall once people have a choice? So before we leap into that logic train right, and say, okay, let's, let's hitch our pony to the sustainability, I think we need to assure ourselves that that fervor holds up even when people face it compared to other societal goods that others may position as being in conflict. So I think, you know, I think it's, it depends on how we define it for people. I mean, I think it, it, it's all in, if we tie it into some, into some values and into some, you know, more historic, put it into some historic context, um, and define it in a way that is not invasive, not, you know, kind of big brother here, um, then, I think you, then I think you're okay. I think it, if you, you know, if you leave it up to, you know, kind of, um, a lot of the myth and fear that gets raised about it, then I think we will have a problem. Just go back to. I mean, if not only nine percent can give you anything specific about it, right? That's a hard. You know, one out of ten people, and in in even that definition, their defining is pretty slim. But when you give them a little bit of information. And present it in a fairly positive way, they get, you know, they're open to the concept of it. They're very open to the concept of it. But we have to, I mean, part of our challenge is to show what's in it for them. How does it impact them? Yes, Jeff, one thing that strikes me, and uh, I don't want to steal the thunder of the rest of the presentation, this might be addressed in the next presentation that Mike's going to give, but. Um, I think it'd be interesting to start thinking about how we use this information. And what jumps out at me is, I mean, there's almost three categories. You have the general aggregate questions that are being asked, which, I mean, my reaction has been largely, that's kind of what I would have guessed for a lot of these. Um, but the second one is the, the geographic breakdown, which I don't think I had any inkling of maybe how that might shake out you know, with those groupings of counties and how people answered. And then the third part is you focused, I think, with your notes mostly on age, but I, I'm sure that the results can be stratified by race or income or education level or things. It seems like that data especially are things that we probably, I would guess, around this table don't have a real good intuitive um, feel for, you know, how, how do minority residents feel about topic A or young people or... Uh, you know, poorly educated or well-educated people was, I just guess what I'm asking, is there anything that jumped out at you of like next steps where we should be Well, going? in terms of next steps, I mean, this is, 
this data gets used in everything that we're doing and everything we're developing. So we're applying, we are going to apply this data into the development of your overall communication strategy and plan. It's also folded into the conditions and trends platform. Um, but some specific things that we're going to do with this is, number one, we'll do a full briefing for you. This is kind of, kind of some highlights right now. Um, we just got the cross tabs, which gets into the demographic information and the detail that you're talking about. Um, race, in terms of race, I haven't looked at it yet. Um, it, I know the sample was about 77% white, 21% non-white, um, and 1% to 2% um, refused. So that's roughly what the sample is, but I can't tell you the differences yet. I haven't, we haven't done that, um, that level of analysis yet. Um, I would hope that, that Bob and Kathy could get into that next week in their report, in their presentation. Second to that, we're also going to share it with the media. So in the morning, we'll do a briefing for you guys, for the board, and in the afternoon, we'll do a media briefing so that we can start to, to share this information with folks. Um, uh, so three-fourths of the area... Uh, Three-fourths of residents say their area's economic future depends a lot on the region. We touched on that a little bit. Um, half of Northeast Ohio residents, but only, I should say, but only half of Northeast Ohio residents have heard about regionalism. Minus two, you know, 47 no, 45 yes. So, you know, there's some work to be done on that here. Uh, there's, that's, you know, that's a you know, pretty interesting finding. Um, uh, I guess that I would say that's a little bit of a surprise for those of us who are involved in these kinds of conversations on a daily basis. This is a little bit of a wake-up call. Um, uh, so, as I said, we're going to do a webinar next uh, Wednesday at 10 a.m. Jeff will send you out the information. There are There's a full report um, with a number of other slides that we will send to you ahead of time. If somebody really is interested in, in looking at the numbers, the details, and boiling this down, and looking at the several hundred pages of cross tabs, we can, um, we can make that available to you and share that with you. Um, and then, in, as I also said, we'll be doing a, a session in the afternoon for the media. So um, any other questions related to the survey or the communications strategy? Yes. Um, just to, to segue off of Jason's comment about the sort of three areas, the only thing I would add to that, in terms of the geography, that another level of that is sort of the urban-suburban. And then, you know, when you're looking at race as a factor, you know, is race a surrogate measure for place-based geography or vice versa? So those kinds of, I think, needs, it's going to need to be teased out a little bit other than just looking at the raw data. Right, and we do, fortunately, we did segment people by urban, rural, and suburban, so. And um, maybe what we could do is after the briefing next week, um, we'll be contacting if there's specific data um, filters that you want us to put on it, and we can deliver that, and if the worksheets have specific requests, we can kind of look at it in different ways. So I think what's interesting about doing this is that we're also going to do it uh, about halfway through the project and then at right. the end of the project. So we'll really start to see how things are affected. Remember, this is your baseline. This is your starting point research. Here's where we are right now, today. We suggested that you do this at some midpoint. I would not suggest you do this in October or November, frankly. People are going to be burned out for, you know, based especially with the spotlight on Ohio. They will be surveyed to death. So. Um, you know, I would think that if we came back in January or February, once the dust has kind of settled a little bit, did a check-in at some point to measure where we are and see how things have changed, and then you go back towards the end of the project and see where you are at the conclusion of it. Yes, Jason. Well, one last question. Um, so you talked at the beginning a little bit about this doesn't really get into why on any of these questions. I mean, we could hypothesize about that. Um, I think part of what I heard you say is it'll help on engagement because we might know better who to reach out to depending on some of the demographic analysis, but will there also be a component where 
we maybe start to delve into the why with further survey work or outreach. You know, for example, if people in a certain group in accounting feel really good or really bad about something, uh, I was just curious what, what the plans might be to, to try to explore that more. Well, I think it's a mixture of, you know, of this work along with the co-op group's work on public engagement and really addressing how we can move this forward and if there's a need for other surveys or, or different groupings of, of how we make this next uh, forward on the survey side. I think we're, we're open to that. It's about discovering those and defining what it is and what's the intention for, for doing that. So this is like that good foundation. Yes. Just a question. In terms of the, the work of the work groups and the work products that result out of the work groups, could you talk a little bit about how the survey process will be used and or public dialogue process will be used to help maybe refine some of that work or inform some of that work? Well, I think both the... I'm sorry. I'll step but um, I think both this work and the work that we're going to um, present, uh, the engagement plan in, in June, will definitely show how uh, the public process will influence the work product, will influence the findings that we go forward with, will influence eventually the dashboard that we're talking about. So I think there will be a lot of different opportunities for that going forward, and that's why I think it's taking us a little bit longer just to get our arms around what the tactical plan is going to be for engagement, because we wanted to get some of this work done and the conditions and trends platform in a good enough shape that we could feel confident going out to the public in July and August. Jason? Sorry, again, I did have one other observation. I was thinking about maybe this echoes a little bit what Brad said at the beginning, but... Um, from a, from a certain point of view, you could probably make the argument that a lot of these survey results point to people are pretty happy with the way things are in Northeast Ohio. What are you guys doing with four and a quarter million dollars trying to tinker with something people are pretty happy with? So that's probably something we need to kind of think about as we, as we work through here in, in crafting our message is what, what are we kind of trying to move the levers of change on? Well, I think, too, it's what they're, what they're happy with is it's sustainable going forward. So I think that's part of the conversation we have to have. Good. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, well, the, the next item is, uh, is related to some degree, but this is more specifically talking about uh, the conditions and trends platform and some of this was presented at a high level at the executive committee but um, I think some of the details have been fleshed out a lot more and uh, looking forward to hearing the presentation so without any further ado I'll turn things over to uh, to uh, Mike Lyons and Joe Hadley and Mike Thomas to frame this one okay well uh, nice to be here today and uh, nice sunny day in Hudson I Mayor would say that. Uh, this uh, this uh, stage that we're at right now, I'm very excited that we've uh, reached this point. I uh, have, have some empathy for Jeff and others on the engagement side that they really have not had a lot to present to the uh, people that they've been meeting with. And um, this is its own collaborative process. Uh, the board uh, selected two board members, Mike Lyons and myself, to uh, act as uh, your input in, in some way to, uh, to this process. Uh, we worked uh, closely with our strategy and, and, and certainly with, um, with members of the staff. So uh, what we're going to do today is uh, talk about the purpose of the Conditions and Trends platform, uh, try to answer a few questions about it. Uh, I think uh, reviewing how to think about the platform um, for uh, someone who comes from a planning organization, and we, we do and have done a lot of reports, uh, I think it's important to understand that uh, this is not a report. You may recall we, there was a change in that terminology, and understanding, I think, the concept of what a platform is is very important to moving forward successfully with this. Uh, we'll talk about some of the 
overall narrative themes and, and how those were developed. Uh, I don't think our intention was to wordsmith or go into detail on those themes. And finally, and also very importantly, uh, what are the next steps as we, as we move forward with this, uh, with this platform? So, uh, you know, essentially the uh, purpose of, the, of this uh, Conditions and Trends platform was uh, uh, really to establish a common base of information and knowledge. Uh, we uh, had a lot of discussions about this. Um, it, it kind of establishes the baseline and, and foundation for the dashboard. I mean, we've talked in, 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 in part and not in a lot of detail about what the dashboard would do and certainly having um, a conditions and trends piece helps feed into what that dashboard uh, would, would look like. Um, the, uh, it establishes uh, uh, an inability to uh, have a regional conversation you know, we have shared conditions, we have shared trends. Now we have something to uh, say, for example, that the Akron area has a similarity to what's happening in Youngstown, or maybe a rural area in Ashtabula can relate to a rural area in uh, Stark County or, or, uh, or uh, Wayne County. Um, certainly brings together um, constituent uh, communities with shared interests. Uh, you know, it, it for example, uh, there, there, there could be an interest in one area or, or groups, I should say, of uh, let's do something more with mass transit than we've done um, to date. Uh, links together the stakeholder base. Uh, you know, w we certainly all are very interested in what our elected officials and, and public and, and the private sector has to uh, say on this entire effort. And this helps to bring all of that together uh, as a platform, as a, as a discussion starting point um, as we move forward. Uh, it builds the capacity for regional action. We, we, if we start off at more or less the same understanding of where we are, uh, we can move forward then. Uh, I know it's uh, in, in this discussion, having that shared understanding has, has at least affected me in terms of I'm starting to think of um, some sustainable solutions or some ways of doing things differently and that I may not have um, done if we had not had that, uh, this effort um, in existence. So I'm going to uh, shift to Mike uh, Thomas with our strategies who's going to explain the importance of this uh, platform and actually what it is and how we can use it. So Mike. Thanks, Joe. Just to back up just, just a step, there's a natural arc to um, NEOS communications. It, it, most, when you talk about arc, communication arcs, you usually talk about beginning, middle, and end. Um, but because you're leading up to action, what we've chosen to do sort of internally is talk about it in terms of ready, set, and go. Right now, you're at the end of, Hunter says, the, um, the end of the beginning, but you're at the, the end of the ready stage, developing your findings and their implications. You're moving into, with the Conditions and Trends platform, the set stage, where you're going to be engaging the region, developing solutions, collaborative solutions with the people you're engaging, um, and taking those constituencies that Jeff talked about earlier and consolidating them into a stakeholder base that would have the, the capacity for regional action. And then the go stage is using that capacity and putting it into play, actually acting, moving towards the, the solutions that you found through your process. Condition, the conditions and trends platform is uh, the stepping off point from the ready to the set stage. It's the initial information that you've, that you've gathered plus the means to present it and interact with it and, and interact with other people around it. When we talk about the conditions and trends platform, we're talking about something that will inform, connect, engage, and eventually help persuade the region around the ideas and uh, the need for solutions that you're going to be developing. But that being said, that's kind of vague. So what is this really going to look like? What are, we, what are we talking about? The easiest way that I've found to think about it is imagine this, that what you're developing was a, just a printed report. You could, take, you could give me that report, and I could cut it down, cut it up into little pieces, into its basic elements, its basic information elements, and paste those onto five by seven cards. 
I could put those in a shoe box and carry them around with me. And anytime I ran into somebody who wanted to talk about this issue, I could say to them, all right, well, how would you like to have your information served up? Would you like it based on, the, do you have an issue interest? Would you like to hear the story behind it? Would you like to hear the story about the work streams that are working on it? And I could pull those cards out and put them up on a bulletin board in order to fit that organizational theme. And I could also ask them, well, what level of information are you interested in? Is this a, you want an intro discussion? You want a medium level discussion? You want a deep conversation with a lot of data? And I could control how many cards I pulled out of the, the box. Well, it seemed to us that the best thing that, that NIAS platform for conditions and trends could do was to be able to automate that process, so allowing the user to decide what level they want their information, how they want it organized to meet their needs, and then serve it up to them. And that's what we're, that's what we're building. That's what we're working towards building. Um, an online tool with a four, a roughly four page executive summary that would um, allow people to access the information in the way that best fits their needs. Um, you know, in, the, in the short term, the way we're sort of seeing that is that they could organize it based on level of depth and in terms of theme, issue, or work stream. In the long term, as you gather more information and add to the database that we're gonna be able to present, you can do it based on location. Like I'm interested in what's happening in my neighborhood or my city and how these issues are affecting us. I'm issued, interested in a, in a program, a policy, or a proposal. And we could rearrange the information that way. In the long term, we're envisioning this to be able to allow people to add their own information, the things that they've found in their communities to the collective database that people have. So at the end of this, you have a shared base of knowledge that people have been adding to and feeling ownership about. Um, so that's really why we're talking about this as a platform and not a report. A report is a static one-way piece of communication. It's a definitive statement at the end of something. And what you're talking about is moving from um, ready to set. You're moving from, you're, this is a beginning, not an end, the beginning of a conversation. It's dynamic, not static, and a platform is a place for people to stand to have a two-way conversation, and that's what this is gonna be. Um, it's gonna be an online tool for your audiences, um, allowing them to see things in the way that best meets their needs. It's gonna be a framework to build toward this regional capacity for action, allowing people to learn from one another and build this common base of knowledge and then collaborate together and it's gonna be a pre presentation of different narratives that promote understanding and commitment. And in a minute, we'll talk about how we're gonna get there and get there within the next month, <laughs> roughly. Okay, so uh, next on your handout are uh, narrative themes. And let me, um, let me point out to you that uh, these actually are in two separate, well, I guess on your, in your document, uh, they're, they're uh, all stapled together. But uh, the, uh, there's an important history, uh, for, particularly for the board members, there's a, uh, an important history that is listed uh, as a separate sheet in front of the uh, detailed findings um, where uh, Mike Lyons and the sta and staff, uh, as well as our strategy, uh, work together um, to develop these the themes that you see in front of you. Um, it's important to understand that uh, uh, these themes flowed from um, some of the priorities or the priorities that were identified by the uh, various work streams. I know uh, as part of the environment work stream, uh, several of the items that we talked about as being pretty important um, were, were uh, listed uh, as part of the themes here. But I think the other important thing is that because so many of these various findings that you saw um, kind of uh, have our, our, their own arc and, and are, are uh, exhibited in other work streams, uh, there was a need to meld these um, uh, various uh, findings together. So what you see in front of you in these uh, six or seven themes are uh, kind of the synthesis of um, 
what we've done. It's a benchmark. Uh, it's a, a launch pad. I don't remember if Mike said that today or if it, he said it uh, another time that we've been together. And this is a real pivot point for uh, this entire effort. Uh, so the, the themes that we see uh, before us, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to list each one, uh, but I think these are are important towards getting the discussion going. Uh, not every one of these themes is are going to going to uh, generate a response from uh, a particular uh, attendee or someone looking at this um, this online. But uh, I think it's very important as a starting point that we say uh, these are what from our from our various uh, work streams what they think are important. Uh, this is what the, our, our board and, and staff feel are important as a, a beginning point in the discussion. I think the other, uh, the other thing I would mention about the, the, um, the platform is that by calling this a platform, we aren't going out and saying, we've, we've researched for years and we, this is the de definitive statement about population. This is our observation about population. If someone has a, a different view, that's all part of the process and, and um, we're comfortable with that. Now there are um, details about those, uh, about each of these themes that, uh, you know, again, are, are supported by the findings. Uh, there may be some comments on those findings, I'm sure. There may be some that people feel we missed. And again, that's all part of the process. And an important part of that process is, okay, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to consider them? Uh, and that's what Mike will finish up with. So, well, as I said, um, our goal is to for your next board meeting, begin to launch the have to hold the launch for the online platform. Um, you can see in broad strokes what we're going to be doing over the next month. Um, this has been uh, a, a, we're trying to work through a very tight process, checking in with the board regularly and consistently about each step that we take um, to ensure that we're providing what you need. Um, and once we hit the launch, please keep in mind that this is going to be an evolving platform. It's, it's going to, it's, we're designing it to be able to add information as you go, um, to be able to tweak information as you go, to reorder it, uh, to uh, add additional tools as you go. Things were, issues were raised at um, the executive committee that were, uh, points were raised that were very well taken, particularly the idea of how are we going to drive traffic to it as this goes. And we're developing strategies for that. We're working on a, a, a plan for how this is going to, how you can roll this out. Um, but it's a starting. The launch is a starting point, trying to build on this platform and build a broader base of knowledge, um, and connect with the different diverse constituency groups that you have out there, and begin to bring them together as a common set of stakeholders for the types for the first behind the need that you, needs that you've identified and then the types of actions you would recommend. There were two additional issues that were raised at the executive committee that we wanted to make sure that we addressed. Um, one had to do with focus groups and survey work about um, the language involved with the, uh, with the findings and the themes. Um, we, can, cons we considered incorporating focus groups for the, for focus groups focusing on language early on in the process. Um, and this is sort of how our thinking evolved on it. We, we, we knew that we'd need an initial public opinion survey, which Jeff's talked about, because we had to establish a baseline to measure against, and we needed to get a general sense of where the population and the different demographics were. Um, you know, as you've seen, we've hired Triad, or you've hired Triad, excuse me, um, and the, they've conducted the survey. Triad brings an enormous amount of expertise, as Jeff mentioned, and we've been, uh, well, as part of our careers, the folks at our, our strategy have been reviewing focus groups about the, around the region for a number of years, um, and we're trying to bring that expertise to bear as well. Um, in the end, our recommendation about using focus groups to, on the language for the conditions and trends platform hinged around how the language would be used. Um, if this were a marketing platform and the language were intended to be final, there wouldn't be a question about it. We would absolutely agree that you needed to take this to focus groups, you need to test it and tweak it and make sure that the language is 
um, is as carefully crafted as possible. Um, but ultimately, the conditions in trans language, as we understand it, is not final language. It's going to be evolving. You're beginning an engaging, engagement process where you're going to have thousands, literally thousands of people adding their opinions um, about both the content of it and the language that's used to describe some of these issues. You take in th this language through an iterative process with your work streams um, and, your, and yourselves, your board, um, back and forth. And we've been tweaking the language all along. And we know that as soon as this goes up, it's almost immediately going to start changing because we're going to start talking about it and saying, how can we say this better? How, can, how will this evolve? Um, so given that, um, it seemed that, well, our recommendation early on and our recommendation still is that investing um, in pinning down conditions in trans language that we know is going to be subject to change didn't seem like it was it would be a prudent use of resources um, and I find that odd as saying that as a consultant he's saying don't spend money um, but because I'm not sure that you get a lot of that but um, it, it doesn't seem like it's the best way to to invest your resources at this moment because you have so much coming up that's going to inform the, inform this and change what you're presenting so that has been our recommendation remains our recommendation I, I hope that answers the question that was you know, that was raised at the executive committee. Um, an additional question was how to share it with member organizations and their boards. Um, our intention is as part of the rollout to ensure that the boards of member organizations receive um, uh, a special link so that they can see what this looks like at, on the day that the board reviews it. It, it, it put, we're in an awkward situation of not wanting to show something to your boards that you haven't approved because, I mean, so the best way we could figure out how to do that was to give them a link on the 26 when you're looking at it yourselves um, and that seemed to be the most appropriate way to split the difference so over the next month we're going to be continuing to work uh, fast and furiously on this um, and I'd be happy to answer questions about the process Jason. Um, one thing I think that the platform needs that um, obviously may may change as we talk about these themes and which themes we're highlighting, but I think whichever ones we arrive at, the comment would stand is I, I think we definitely need in the platform a lot of maps and data backing up a lot of the, the assertions or um, themes that we've identified. So I was just curious if you guys were able to share at all where, where that might stand and would that be part of the rollout on June 26th or is that going to be um, kind of a work in progress? Oh no, it, it's definitely part of the rollout. We, don't, we want to be able to demonstrate how each, we're not doing anything without demonstrating it factually. That's the point. I mean, it would undermine your entire effort to put out a finding without being able to back it up. I mean, you're not just making assertions, you're gathering um, you've been gathering findings from other sources. You have data to back up these claims, at least. Um, that's, that's what we're presenting to people. And if we don't have adequate data, then it's, it would not be our, we would not suggest that you put it up. Um, what we've done in that regard is that working with the staff and on glass cubes, we've created um, a spreadsheet of all 25 of the separate findings. And all 25 fit under the six, um, the six narrative themes in different fashion. Um, and the staff has been going in and identifying the uh, supporting element, the supporting data, the supporting graphics, supporting imagery that goes with each of the findings. Um, what we have, what we need to develop, who needs to develop, where, where it stands, and so forth. So we're tracking all of this to try to, well, we are going to ensure that it is uh, all, com it all comes together into the final presentation of the, of the initial iteration of the platform. Uh, Jason and Steve, you both have your hands. So, go, go ahead, Steve. Uh, clarify, when will we see the data and the underlying, um, uh, if you will, facts of, under the findings? I mean, right now the narrative themes are fine, but it's the, it's the finding uh, verbiage as well as the underlying data that supports those statements. When will we see that? Won't see that until the 26th? Well, no, the finding, the finding verbiage that's, that's in, it's not up on the screen, but in your packets, is stuff that was reviewed by the executive committee at the last meeting, and you're seeing it at this I'm point. Not, I'm not sure that there's an agreement that, that those findings are absolute, the language or the data underneath it. There are questions. 
of that. So what opportunity, is that just, we're going to be doing that at the executive committee, or well, what is that going to be done? I think my, my hope would be that we could maybe even have some of that discussion right now. You know, if there are themes that people, um, pe people find either maybe with some of the verbiage or, or um, themes that you see aren't really being captured very explicitly. Well, I, I, I'm actually, I'm more focused on the findings, not the themes themselves. Themes are the, the, the broad general statements, that's fine. It's the findings themselves and some of the, the data that underlies it, that's where the questions All lie. The and we brought that up during our connections uh, work stream uh, this morning. Well, it was my understanding, and you all can correct me if I'm wrong, um, that, and I'm curious about the, the connections work stream because the, when we received the findings, uh, with the exception of, and when we worked through the findings, with the exception of, um, I guess housing, they had, our understanding was they had been vetted through the work streams. Housing hadn't met yet. We sent it back. We took it back to the work stream. Um, are you talking about the ones that came specifically from the work streams, or are there other findings out from other ones? She here. She presented. Okay. Steve, I would say that some of the uh, way those findings are worded uh, are not directly linked to to uh, a map. Let's say, and some of them might take a while. For a 12 county area to put together. Well, I, that, well that, that begs the question. You've made a statement, uh, let's say, uh, just finding uh, theme number one, finding number two, investments in infrastructure in Northeast Ohio since the 1970s were informed by the assumption of population growth that was not borne out. What is the underlying data? What, in, what infrastructure you're talking about with specificity? Or what, what decisions are you made that, that were made that do link the population? I know I questioned that staff and said that out months ago, um, or a month or two ago, and I, where is the underlying data? Who has that? I mean, that's just one. I'm sure there's a whole load of these other findings. That, that's my real question. There's a number of these that make statements and, and the findings, and uh, you need more clarity and more specificity. Just to use the word infrastructure, what, what is that? Are we talking about roads, water, sewer, fiber optic? Well, so uh, I don't know. I'm wondering if, for what it's worth, I think these themes are terrific, and I think the findings are compelling. I just to build on Steve's point, maybe what we need to do is, is in effect, have reference to the uh, the annotated bibliography or whatever it is. That you know, on what basis do we say that? Obviously, if we stuck all the source data in here, you'd have a 35-page thing that nobody could understand. But if if there was some way that people can connect to on what basis we say that. Well, let me um, take a look. For what it's worth, I agree. It, this is very compelling to me. Well, let me take a step back on how this was created, and, and maybe that'll help. Um, the, uh, the project managers developed um, a set of, well, they, they developed a set of reports based on the work their work stream had done. Um, we consolidated those into a single document that was somewhere between 100 and 150 pages long. We boiled that down into roughly 125 statements of fact that we could identify in based on the outline and the, and the, uh, the narrative version of those reports um, that we could identify 125 statements of fact. We then took those and working with the staff um, with a couple members of the board, we were able to pare those down into the 25 findings. And from the 25 findings, we worked backwards to the themes. Okay, if these are the main findings, thematically, how do you tie them together? And now we're going back and plugging in additional data and minor findings, you know, things that may be supportive of one of the other findings, but there, we suspect there will be others that, that won't be, that'll be out there so by themselves. Where do they fit into this? And each will have data, each will have the data linked back to it. And if the data isn't good, if in the end we, we decide that it's not supported, it's not, going to be in, it's not going to be in a final document. In terms of vetting the language, we tried to be uh, iterative in this, bringing it back and letting people go over it. Um, and we are going to continue to entertain you know, issues, any issues that especially the board has, about what, how these statements are being made. 
um, to make sure that they're as accurate as we can make them. Um, and any feedback in that regard that you want to give us, like, you know, show, we will have the supporting, you'll be able to see the supporting documentation, um, and there will be opportunities for you to comment and to advise us on what needs to be changed, whether things should be in, whether things should not be in. We built in um, a, uh, uh, about a week long sort of beta testing process and before that, we'll have text together. Um, this is, we're, because of the speed under which we're working, we're trying to do this iteratively as we're moving forward and, and functioning it, at, or, I'm sorry, we're sharpening it as we go. There, there was a question behind you, Steve. And then Can I just enter? I think your comment's well taken, Brad. And, and uh, it's my understanding that the Center for Community Solutions is under contract to map some of these. Yes. Yeah. The, the, uh, there, there's mapping going on that backs this up. There's also data. I think what the problem is when you when you bundle it up into 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 themes and topics, you need to, you, know, you you lose sight of the underlying data. As as just um, was said, I think, you could, as I think you said, Brad, you could have a, a long bibliography. I think Steve, if there are specific areas, and, and this is one of them. Let's un unravel that and say, how do we get to that point? What is the, what is the supporting information that's behind that? So, I mean, we're, this is a, a certain amount of, of um, risk in terms of making broad themes around 12 counties, around 40 years' worth of development. But I think we can pull that back out for you. Here's my question. You, you talk about the iterative process. I know on several of these I have made a comment, but never received any response back as to, you know, I have one, one perspective, one viewpoint, obviously. I'm, I'm not all-knowing, all-wise. So at least I, I'll, I made some comments based upon my finite knowledge, never received any input, and then as I see the findings, there's nothing reflected in that. To make, so it makes me wonder, did you not receive it? Was there other data that was, that was more compelling? Was there information I had wrong? Those are, it, it reiterative means back and forth. I received nothing back. So that's the question I have: Is are we really deliberate in this? And are other board members making, as part, or even work stream members, have they then contributed to some of this? And they indeed have they have, have they received responses as well regarding some of those findings and the data that underlies it? That's the question. Well, I, I can say one thing about it, which is that um, one of the things that we did based off of I guess it was I think it was after the executive committee meeting. Immediately after the executive committee meeting, we started a new area on glass cubes just were, as a repository for all the feedback that we're receiving so that we'll be able to track it. Um, I don't know that your comment made it into the repository. Um, I'd have to go back and look. Uh, my, predate, my comments even predate that executive committee. Can I take us a step further back, too? Because I think what's important is we have an opportunity right now to have that back and forth and provide input so one piece of input I would like to provide is I think that a theme that is really important that is implicit in a lot of these but I don't think it's as explicit as I would like to see speaking for myself is that we don't we don't have a built environment generally that's conducive to four dollar a gallon or higher gas prices it's captured I think in some of these themes but I, I would be interested in maybe seeing some sort of addressing that, that we don't have all, for most residents, we don't have alternative means of transportation other than driving, whether people would want to take advantage of them or not. And I think there's a lot of mapping and data that we could pull together to show, you know, where sidewalks are, where public transit. For example, the board meeting in Youngstown, if we made it a project for everyone to get to that meeting via transit, no one would be able to do it other than people in Mahoning County primarily and maybe Trumbull. So I think there's, I think one of the main whys of why there's even an NEOSCC and why HUD created the program is because there is a recognition that across the United States, we have not built <coughs> things over the last 60 years that you can do anything other than to drive to. So I, I personally speaking, I'd like to see that be elevated a little bit more as a theme. Well, here, here's the challenge as far as I can tell, Jason. Um, our job is to try to help you find ways, the best way possible to communicate what you found. Um, the findings were based on the, the 125 statements of fact that we were able to pull out of the, 
document, and the themes were based on the 25 findings. If, I mean, it goes to what, in part, what Steve is saying, that you have to have a finding of, a factual finding to support a statement. And at this moment, given what, I mean, I know that 125 database sort of backwards and forwards because I've had to look at it for the last couple months. I, I don't know how to pull out from there um, how to support what you're what you want thematically at this moment, but that doesn't mean that it can't be added to as the platform evolves. So I, I think there is a way. Okay. Uh, but, but because I, I think you've set forth. Look, you're our communications consultant. You're not our content consultant. So it's, it's even unfair for you to try to have to answer questions about content here. But I think you've said, given all the information that you have been provided, here is your best effort to pack it and so forth. And then you've said that by your by design, this is going to be a living set of materials. Mm -hmm. It feels to me like then if we say this is where we start, and then we have this ability to suggest changes, and then right. we need a process for how we vet those changes. Right. And we can't have a rack breakdown like Steve described, where he, he feels like he's made three suggestions Absolutely. and there's been radio silence. But if we now have a mechanism to do that, then you can say, okay, we've gotten six suggestions refer it to the appropriate committee. If the committee buys into it, we come here, and then we say, we're going to change the themes or change the findings. That works. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, Mayor, and I guess Jeff had to stand up, too. Just with the end in mind, uh, I'm assuming at the end that some of the products that we're going to be anticipating would be solutions that would address some of these themes. Yes. So is the intent from this effort to communicate, to get people to agree or disagree with those themes and then react to them with some additional information that can then be used to help inform the solutions. And if that's the case, mm -hmm. how does that fold in to a next stage of engagement? I know that's a whole separate question, but in my mind, I'm trying to think about what the end product looks like and how this is going to inform it. And what I'm not clear about in my own mind is, is the intent to get people to agree or disagree on these themes and then react to them so that that information can go back to the committees and inform the discussions about solutions that we're going to be suggesting in the region and then do we take those solutions back and throw them out in the last phase and act, ask people to react to them again? I, I don't know, I'm just asking. Well, I could try it, but I'll, you've had your hand up forever. Hi, I'm Sorry, on the communication and engagement work stream, so I'm, I'm with you on that. And I would, um, I, I guess my concern, and I would I really love a process that we could all vet these and, and come up with things that we agree on, and in those conversations are gonna be some really interesting things that are said because number three I totally disagree with you know you're setting this up to to be that if we had more information everything would change and that's only one bit of changing and that means we've got to change our mental models and how we believe a community should look so um, I just want to throw that out and I would welcome anything um, any process by which we can evolve these. I, I agree with that because I think on number three, I think our land use and development choices have been close to entirely rational based on assuming gas is 95 cents a gallon like it has been for a lot of, you know, a lot of the time period since World War II if you averaged it out. So I agree it may be a deeper issue than a lack of information. It may be, you know, moving forward and in the next 50 years that's, and I think that ties back to the survey. I mean, people are pretty satisfied with their quality of life right now. I think, you know, when I pose that question about people could say, then why is there an NEOSCC? I think part of the answer is because we don't know how satisfied they're going to be 50 years from now. And that's one reason that we're, you know, that we're in business. It, it does tie back to the survey, but if I could for a second, I think I can speak to that. Um, what that theme represents is a general finding that seem to be emerging from each work stream that while we're getting better at what we're able to measure, we haven't always been able to measure the right things. 
um, people are fairly satisfied with where things are now, but they may not be satisfied with where things are headed. And they may not have a sense of where things are headed because we can't measure it appropriately. That's how I understood what the work streams were saying. What we tried to do was come up with language that that spoke to the fact that information has been relatively limited. It's getting better. It needs to get better still. Yeah, I think that that particular one is an attempt to take and summarize two specific findings around the ability of communities to determine the long-term costs, the fiscal impacts of the decisions that they are making, and to make those decisions with the life cycle costs in mind. Um, our observation is that there is a lack of ability to do that. And, and the second is that, um, and this is very clear from anybody who's done economic development, that the work is, is basically project driven and not, not usually in a context of a longer term uh, vision. <coughs> Those are two observations. I believe the I know the second one came out of economic development. I believe uh, I can't remember ex exactly where the first one came out of. Quality connected places. Okay, but it, the 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 idea is this is a headline. If the headline causes heartburn, then the headline should change. Uh, but it's driving to the definition of what scenario planning needs to be for this region with a stable and slightly declining long-term population base. Um, again, if the headline is wrong, then, needs, then we need to correct the headline. If the facts that are, that are summarized are unclear, we need to go back to our committees and give you the citations that take you to this point. Um, but again, we run the risk here because it's a 12-county region to trying to make broad generalizations to tee up a conversation about, about where we're headed. And, and that goes back to what the what I, I, I didn't want to neglect your question. <laughs> um, to what the question the mayor was asking about how does this all fit together? Uh, we're not as your communications consultants. We're not in a position to speak to the engagement plan. We're at, and that's I guess on the agenda for your next meeting. But I can say that the goal here is to present the information that you found in a meaningful way that allows people to begin to talk about it. Um, our assumption all along has been that this is the starting point of a conversation, that we've been trying to be very careful not to preempt your engagement process by implying inc conclusions that would show people that they, that they don't need to be engaged because you've already made up your mind, because that's often an accusation with planning processes. Um, and what we're hoping the online space will become is a place for people to come together, use it as a tool to find information about what their interests are, and begin to see how their concerns are interconnected with other concerns that people share throughout the region. Um, we're, design, we're trying to design it in a way so that whatever way your engagement process goes and whatever products come out of this, you'll be in a good position to be able to communicate broadly about broad policy matters and encourage people to take action at their local level just as, just as well. So it's not just an entirely top-down um, approach, but you'll have capacity online to encourage people at the local level. And they'll be able to come back to this and use it as a, a living, breathing resource that they can add to, they can refine, and, and continue to use. I would just react to that by saying that um, I think it's very important for all these three pieces of the communications strategy to fit together mm -hmm. and um, that the information that you throw out there produces the byproducts that are going to be necessary to inform the next phase of engagement and communications. And I think that there needs to be some additional dialogue about how that fits together because I'm not convinced yet. I second that, and I, Mike, I agree with your aspiration of uh, <coughs> a, a robust, interactive tool for engagement. What I want to make sure doesn't happen, though, is that the board members end up being the people that don't fit in with that robust tool, because I think to what Steve said, I mean, he made comments in the past about 
those themes, and it didn't seem like we had a good mechanism to address that. And I think going forward, we have to find a way that our input gets somehow reflected in, in what ends up being put out there. Well, I, I, this is kind of scary feeling like the issuance of the conditions, existing conditions report is about to be pushed out again. And I think we need to do everything we can not to have that happen. And so what I would suggest is that around this board table, we're given 72 hours to comment. If there is a comment about this doesn't go far enough or we're uncomfortable with it or whatever, it's referred to the committee chair and then comes back and there's some resolution. Mm -hmm. And then second, if uh, in terms of the three groups, with the three groups engagement communications and something, but that, that, well, that there is an explicitly the connection of those three groups in the next 96 hours so that, by God, we hit the deadline for the existing conditions report. Including comments that we made today. Yeah, and, and everybody gets their comments followed up with. Well, you know, I, pardon me, uh, the, uh, no matter what words we use, there will be different interpretations of those words. So I would ask everyone to be, uh, at least be generous in your interpretation of what we how we articulate for you. In instance number three, our land use development choices have been handled by a little bit of information. If, if, we, if we interpret that one way, we will hate it. We interpret another way, we can see some sense in it. So no matter how we phrase these things, that there will be some of that uh, that exists. So uh, I mean, we're going to proceed with this process. I do think that uh, if we see this as a platform for dialogue, we do need to pay attention to how we manage that dialogue, and that's another task that we have to we have to refine. There's no no question about that, uh, and that's a challenge for us. So, uh, and we have to work on. That. Uh, how, sorry, how are you to come? Yeah, I, I think that uh, you know, trying to understand some things right. We're, we're looking at that from a 12 county regional basis. Right. Uh, the fact is, most of those decisions that we view as uh, being hampered by limited information or putting folks at risk and all those kinds of things were really made by individuals, made by businesses, made by local governments. They weren't made by any 12 county agency or organization. It didn't exist. So we're, we're applying a standard that's may not be fair in, in some reality. Standard. Because I mean, the information, when I look at land use development choices and get with the individuals making their own informed choices, they had all the information they needed to feel comfortable to make a choice and have lived with it and are fairly satisfied <laughs> from what we can tell. What we are trying to figure out though is that because of this, the rules of the game in place, as a region, we're not all thriving. Localities are having various degrees of success or failure. And what we're trying to do, I think, here is to begin to bring it all together as one boat and try to raise us all up and make sure that those that are doing well can continue to do well and don't face the cycle that so many other communities had in our region of climbing up the mountain, looking at the summit, and then going down <laughs> in the valley again. So, Individual decisions can be perfectly rational. Yes. When you take a thousand individual decisions, put them side by side, it may not be so rational. That's that's what I'm getting. Jason, can I just add one? Sure. I just I just wanted to mention at least to, to help uh, hopefully allay some fears is that we do have a document on glass cubes that has between one or many pieces of data that supports each of the 25 findings. So that it may, it, we need to work out some quirks at least with regard to making sure it's all in one place, but if you want to take a look at that, if it's not ready now, it would be ready tomorrow morning to take a look at for each finding what data at least we've all used to support each finding. And again, it might just be one piece and it might be multiple. The data itself is not there in front of you. What it is is the who has it and how it will be presented to the audience in this forum. So, so that is where the data is. None of what we've done for this to date is original research. It's all based on information that is already present. We're, we're 
aggregating coalescing in a way that has never been done before, at least in this region, and presenting it sometimes over time or perhaps static as in 2010 or whenever the most recent information is available. But there is information that exists to support each of the findings, which is how the themes were arrived at. So I think hopefully that will be helpful for you in your assessment on that is. But it is. It, we're not doing original research for this. So there's nothing that we created to present to the region at this, at this moment, at least. Freddie? I just have a uh, very simple uh, suggestion that within the 72 hour window, if people submit information or additions to this, that if you know of a finding that support what you're talking about, you should submit that to save staff and others the time and have to go and research, particularly if it's something that you, you value and that you have observed or your staff or so your team have observed, where you can provide the data to the uh, consortium I think you should take the liberty to submit that along with your recommended suggestion. So I think that'll be a very important thing for people to keep in mind when they submit their, their stuff. John? Um, a couple of procedural things. I would just ask that comments come to me and I can get it to whoever. Right, good. Um, that be a clearinghouse. I would also say in doing that, that if there's comments related to specific work stream findings, that we will need to go back to those work streams and talk to them about it. Because this again is the work of you know five different groups of 40 people over the last six months. So this isn't something that the staff or our strategy came up with. This is the underlying findings have been vetted and approved by and validated by the workshops themselves. So just so you know, we're going to be taking your input, going back to them, and seeing how they react to it as well, and then trying to come to some conclusion or consensus or airing of those two things because. Uh, I worry too that because you might not find something compelling, and they do, that we will be um, seen as uh, disengaging some of the input that they have provided over the last well, season. Let me clarify something there, though, because then it is coming back here. And I agree completely with Brad. I, I, hopefully, my comments weren't interpreted as let's not get this done by June 26th. I'm just I just want to be sure that as we move forward that the people around this table have a voice in the products that we're going to be endorsing. And I think regardless of what other, whatever machinations or procedures we came up to arrive at those 25 points, the fact remains that at some point NEOSCC, which is this board, is going to sign off on something and say this is what we think the state of the region is. And I think it is real important that everybody around this come table be comfortable with that. And I don't think that disagreements over wording were, are at all unusual. I mean, there's 30 people around this table. I would be shocked if we were, had a consensus. For purposes of our June deadline, once we get our comments in, in the work stream to meet, I think for purposes of that deadline, we need to agree to say, this is, these are, the findings that are pertinent to those work streams and rely on them, knowing that they may change. Because we, we, we have to, we have to do that line. We have to go there. So the procedure, the process, Jeff, is that the questions go to you, you refer them to the work streams, comes back to you and comes back to the board. Yeah, does that sound good? So there's a, there's a, there's a question and answer dialogue. Um, and there's a clear audit trail. Uh, when it comes back to, to, to Bob's point, I think, yeah. um, when we come to June 26th, it's the time to decide to launch the product. So the feedback loop between the input that you get from the board and then responding to whether or not something has been altered, will that be you're anticipating some sort of email exchange or prior to the 26th? To oh, yeah. What I think we can do, Jeff, is just send an email out. Here's here are the internal deadlines to make sure that we get the right. answers timely. But just so I mean, so we're talking about after we go to the work stream, come back, coming back to the board again before we go public. Are we going to rely on the work streams to take all the you know all the comments because we can be back here again because. The, this board may not agree with the language at the work stream. Yeah, I mean, right. at some point you got to make a decision. Come back to uh, the small committee, Mike and I, and our strategy and staff to kind of sift through that and. You know. 
it might be that we just rebuild with the coach here the worst year then yeah. and knowing that it's a starting it's yeah. at the next board meeting when there will be a more or less final draft right. of this, of this, this uh, and this is a platform for discussion understanding that we're, we're at that point unless somebody uh, shoots us we're going to propose going out with it so you're going to have to you're going to have to affirmatively stop us at that point. but holly that holly raises sort of, a very important yeah. question which is how do the if these are questions for discussion how do we help frame those questions further right i mean i, I guess i'm a lot less concerned about the validity of the findings i i have confidence in the findings i'm more concerned about the next step the next you know how all these processes fit together and what are we going to do with the information because it's one thing to put the findings out and if we put it put the findings out and we collect comments we feed that information back to the committee you know i would think that the purpose of all that would be to inform the next phase of the process which is the, the final product and that is i think we're we're supposed to be suggesting solutions to the challenge that is that that are reflected in these themes, and so my concern is just making sure that the engagement process aligns with the information we're putting out there, so that it can really <coughs> inform the final product. Well, we have Patty Choby here, who's our engagement consultant, and we're meeting this week for a full day. And I'm hopeful, Patty, that that concern is yeah, clearly absolutely. woven in. That this is not just a, a report for its own sake. It tees up a set of questions or an approach to get to your to your state your your issue. How do, what do you do about it? Do do so about I think I think we need to come back to you with how how the how that link is to be forged in a very explicit way and not accidental. And, and I'll just add that that has been the unnamed engagement communications uh, working group. What you're asking has been an active part of our discussion uh, and, and, and this is a pivot point uh, and I agree with you that it is an essential thing but there has been a, a, a significant integration of <coughs> planning uh, on those different phases. All that is communication and engagement. The work of the board to take this to another step is, is another dimension of what we're working on. Their communications uh, help to us to help articulate things. But the work of, of identifying and even explaining <coughs> what, what the findings are, that's that, that's part of our discussion. Then what do we do with those findings moving forward? That's board work. They're, they're, they're helping us articulate things and helping us in that purpose. But what we have some hard work to do on that you here. I, I, what I'm hearing in terms of a process and just where I think we could get some closure, so if people are giving ideas to Jeff, Jeff, if necessary, is farming him to the work stream that's working. My sense is, is that he'll feed that to your committee. I'm wondering if then if you can, if, if you're not accepting what has been offered, you turn to that person and say, can you live with it or whatever. Mm -hmm. If they can live with where we land, it stays in, we vote on June 26 to do it. If they say we can't live with it, then you have to put some sort of weasel language for that piece until the 26th, then we come here as a group and we vote on it. Does that work as a plan? Is that a plan of approach? To keep out, keep within our time frame? Okay. Well, then I would, I would suggest that we uh, refrain from referring to the 26th as the publishing date and refer to it as the voting date because otherwise we would have media there and if, what if you don't vote to go forward? No, Brad is saying that we no, no, I'm saying that you have something that we can publish, but if there's one finding or there's a tweak on a theme or something, if, if we go with language we can work with, recognizing it, we may change it in the next 24 hours or 42 hours. We're going to leave it as it's designated now, uh, Jeff. We're going to have to make an evaluation as we get this input and have a dialogue as to whether we feel we do have to change that. But for, for right now, this is our plan. Right. And we're going to stick with it 
And we need to have that dialogue if there are right. problems that are so fundamental that we anticipate uh, non-approval, then we'll have to shift our strategy. Right, that's how boards but, work. But as of right now, this remains our strategy. So we're going to continue to call it that. But but we, we have to be able to have the capacity to adjust to reality. You, you have a... There's an issue here that you have a public expectation that has been raised by at least three different sources of media, maybe more, but at least three that I can think of, that are expecting a, a public launch of this report or platform by June 26. You had an editorial in the uh, Cleveland mm-hmm. Plain Dealer, you had a Steve Lid column. Yep. And trust me, he calls us once a week about it to check in. Um, and you had a Steve Hoffman column in the Accurate Beacon Journal about two weeks ago. So on the 26th, I think the expectation is that you're presenting this publicly. I'm not sure how you can vote up or down on the overall report. I think if, because if for some reason you vote down on this report, you cannot launch it publicly. You can't unveil this. You can't present it and show it publicly. And I grew up in the Mahoney Valley. I know the Youngstown media fairly well. Um, you'll have all three TV stations at that board meeting. Um, uh, you'll have the Vindicator there. You'll probably have the Tribune Chronicle. We know that Steve Litt is chopping at the bit for this. So I think we'll... If somebody thinks they're going to vote this thing down, please have the decency to let Joe know. So I, I, I think we need to... I would vote for this today. I mean, I, I don't think, I, I think there's a lot of angst that somehow the board won't approve this. I, I, I think we just want to be able to have a dialogue about being able to adjust the findings, you know, yeah, going, I, going forward. I thought, I thought we would be at a general consensus rather than an up or down vote. Well, it, it, if I could, as I understood your suggestion, Brad, um, the idea would be that there would be something, if, if as this process proceeds, we identify areas where there's matter of contention. Um, those will be flagged. We'll make sure that there is something that is not contentious that can be launched regardless on the 26th. If we need more time to work those through, I would suggest that we use the executive committee meeting, if we can, to work through any matters of contention. And that one way or another, whatever is presented to the board on the 26th is something that, even if, if, if I don't know that we'll find something that's so contentious because none of this is original research. It's, as Emma said earlier, it's stuff that's collected from other people. So it's not, it shouldn't be a huge matter of contention because if we're doing it right, I mean, it's just stuff that's out there. It's taking the fact that it's already out there. Um, so, w- but one way or another, we'll have something that, that should not be contentious for people to launch, for the, us to launch on the 26th. But, but if, if you're talking to an editorial board and you're going to launch this information, I'm not disagreeing with the information. I'll support the information. The platform's fine. But I think the next logical question is, okay, we know what the state of the region is. What's NAOSCC's role in taking it to the next level? And I think that's where we really need to make sure that we understand what the process is, that, that you're able to articulate that this is a starting point for a platform and, and to very specifically say what we're going to do with this information because as of right now I, have, I still haven't heard that explanation and, and I would think that that, that's, that may come up and we'll, I don't think we want to get caught short in that conversation we absolutely agree So do we have clarity on what we are doing on the 26th? My, my takeaway was we are voting to approve a platform, but we are also <coughs> developing uh, something that can be let out to the media, I think, regardless. Is that what everyone heard? I would hope that we could. Well, it goes public. It launches data. Any... Uh, any further discussion before we close this one out? I definitely would reiterate, get comments through Jeff, right? If people have comments on. I would pose the question right now, based upon what you see, those who are here, is there anything you see that would cause you to, to, uh, to uh, oppose the moving forward with, with this, roughly speaking, as you see it now? I mean, is there, would you? 
you tell us not to roll this out, even even if we were rolling it out today? Do you want to do a show of hands? Well, I'm yeah. just, yeah. Let's, 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 I, whoever would vote to approve what you saw today, raise your hand. All right. I probably I'm glad you wanted that. I, I probably would. I'd want to take the take the suggested seventy-two hours and, and take a look. But what I would say to get to the same point would be, you know, if everyone here and everyone that's not here is told by email, seventy-two hours, get your comments in, and there is a feedback in the back to them. If they're then it should be a, at that point, they should, everyone should be satisfied. You have a chance, and and speaking to to your point, Steve, as long as that is not sort of lost in the nether world, right? if there's a response back and you have a communication, you know this is going through this work stream. This is the language. I hear you, but this was the process. This is how we got there. Maybe we could tweak it a bit. <laughs> At that point, you know, no, I, to, to have people voting no on the 26 seems ludicrous to me. If that process is in place. My, my question is that, like I said, on the themes, it's, I, there, I challenge or question some of the findings, and I've yet to get a response back to the questions I had. Right. So, the, I mean, without that, I'm not going to vote to support some of those findings. But my point, I guess, is yeah. in, the, in the 72 hours, if you oh, sure, I get if, if you if you yeah. communicate that back and you get a response, and then there's and if need be, there's a conversation to say this is right. Sure. I, if somebody shows me the data. Fine, I've been. I was telling the commissioner here, I've been proved wrong before, I'm married, and I'm kind of used to it. So. <laughs> you know, those are the same questions that the media is going to ask. Exactly. I mean, they're going to look at this and they're going to say, well, how did you derive this theme? I mean, what is your supporting data? Because they're going to want to know it. They're not going to just write about it and say, okay, this looks great to us. They're not, they're, that's not bred in them. So they are going to ask those really difficult questions. If we can't ask them, then we're going to so just to clarify, say this, this 72 hour window still stands where people make any suggestions, recommendations that could be vetted so that things can move on like they need to move on by the 26th. So if someone has comments or any addition or anything that they want to elevate or need to be done during that time period. Yeah, I think to George's. That's still in play. And I think to George's point, we should just have a mechanism that in that 72 hours, or Sarah, between that and between that and the next board meeting, if changes are made, that just you know an email gets sent out to everybody and let them know what the changes were, so we have a heads up going into the next board meeting. Yeah. 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 Kind of what hap what what went down. That's a good idea. Didn't you talk about Brad? Didn't you say that 72 hours are individuals that the stuff would go back to the work stream groups for 24 hours for this? Hopefully, hopefully this is small stuff that gets resolved. Right. If it's like, hey, here's this whole new thing, get the work stream. My guess is you All right. It looks like people are. People are voting with their feet, so why don't we bring this item to a conclusion? Is there uh, is there any other business to bring before the consortium before we adjourn? Thank you. Okay. Who's the motion? Who made the motion? Motion for Mr. Mayor. Second. All in favor, say aye.